Hey guys, welcome to the seventh lesson on fundamentals of C sharp programming. Today we're going to be talking about classes. We're going to talk about what a class is and how we use them in programming. Alright, so to start off, C sharp is an object oriented programming language. Now, that means that the programming language itself is driven and based off of objects. Now, what is an object? In real life, objects are things like houses, people, know, trees, cars. They're objects. Each of those things that I said have characteristics to them and can perform actions. For example, a car has a color. It could be blue, green, whatever. It has a color associated with it, and it can perform some actions. It can drive, reverse, you know, change gear, and things like that. Now, C Sharp is considered an object-oriented program language because it can represent those objects in code. It can represent an object like in like in a car that has color and actions like driving, it can represent that in, in the code, and then we can use and manipulate that code to perform different types of actions. So that's why it's called object-oriented programming. Now, we create these objects using classes. We create a class, and then we can create an object based off of that class. Now, let's we're going to start off with building a class for an employee. An employee has an ID number, and then our employee can also do some talking and like he could say a welcome message and display, you know, a simple message. Um, so we're just gonna start off with building this employee class. So the first thing that you need to do is create the class. Now we could create this class in the same file, but I'm gonna create a different file just for teaching purposes. So, I'm going to move, okay, hold on, let me move this so everyone can see. So, you go to your Solutions Explorer, which is on your right-hand side, and you right-click on your project name. You then go to the Add, and you can either go to Add New Item, or because classes are common, you can go right to a class right here. So, you click that. Then, you give your class a class name, and mine's going to be called Employee. And then you just hit add, and your employee class, as you can see in your Solution Explorer, gets added into your project. Let me go ahead and put that back. Okay. Now, after since we did this, we now have a, a new class called employee. So we're going to start off by giving our employee our, a few characteristics. Well, in this case, we're going to give it a characteristic of an ID number. So in order to do that, we're gonna, we need to create a field or a variable that's unique to this class. Um, we're going to mark this variable as private, and I'll talk about why we do this later on, but it's, it's to hide and protect data, which we'll talk about when we get into properties. So I'll mark this as private, and then, then it goes along with just creating a normal variable, so int id number semicolon. We're not specifying a value for a variable here because this is just the definition of the class. When we actually create objects of this class, then we'll specify the ID number for that specific object. The next thing we're going to create is a function that will display a message from the employee. So we'll mark it public so that other classes can access this. The return type is going to be void and then we'll call it welcome message. We're going to take in no parameters and our function is simply going to write to the console and it's going to write a message saying welcome from employee number and we're going to plug in the employee's number using the ID number field and then console.writeLine how can I help you? So this is our simple class that is made. 
Now, before we go ahead and talk about this more, I wanted to say that when you have variables or fields that are class-wide or class-level scope, that is not defined within a function. So like this variable is defined class-wide. If you don't specify a default I mean, a value for it, it will use its default value, and which for an integer is the value 0. So because we don't have one specified right now, right now it has the value of 0. Okay, now we have our class defined. We need to create instances of this class or objects. Now, or instance of this object. Now, one thing to note is the class definition, which is right here, is the blueprint for the class, meaning we can use this class to build multiple versions of our employees. We can make multiple employees based off of this class. It's the same thing in real life. If you're building a house, you make a blueprint for it. But then you decide, oh, I want to make another house that is identical to the first house. You're not going to remake the same blueprint. You, instead, you're going to use the existing blueprint to build the second house. So this, this is the same thing here. We have one class definition, which is our blueprint, and we'll use this blueprint to create many versions of this class. So, so to begin creating versions of this class, we're going to go to our program and our main method. Just like creating intrinsic data type variables like we did in previous lessons by going int x equals 5 or double y equals 5.5 this are basic basic ways of creating variables the part the first part of the variable is its data type followed by the name of the variable and this is gonna be the same exact way that we create our new classes since we created this class called employee employee is now a customly defined data type just like integer is so the first thing to do to make a variable is we need to specify the data type, which is going to be employee. The second thing is going to be the employee's name or the name of the variable. So we'll call it E1 for employee 1. And then we need to assign it a value. Now, because classes are reference types, and we went over what the difference between reference and value types are a little bit in previous lessons, value types are data types or memory locations that store the data right there. It's associated to the data right there. And and if we pass a, a value type into a function, we pass a copy of the data type um, because it's a value type. Now, if we have a reference type variable, which is like this, the reference type is equal to a, a, a memory location rather than the actual value. It's equal to a memory location because uh, it's because it's a reference type. So if you pass a reference type into a function, you're actually passing the reference to the function rather than the actual data. So that if the function manipulates that reference, it changes the data in all places because they all point to the same memory location. So to create a reference type variable, we need to use the new keyword. And the new keyword the new keyword's job is to set aside memory for this new location and then return the, the address or the reference to that memory location back to our employee variable. So that's what the new keyword does. It allocates new memory. The next part of the, the last part actually of the creating a reference type variable is to specify what kind of variable we're we'll creating again so we'll say employee, but then we need to call what is called the constructor. So in previous lessons, I'd said that when we, when we see open and close parentheses, that denotes that we are using a function or doing a function call. And the same thing applies here. This is the syntax to creating a reference type variable. In this case, we're doing one of type employee. All right, so the, the constructor here, these two parentheses are calling a function definition. The constructor's job is to create and or initialize 
um, values to variables, initialize things, and get the class ready to be used um, before you start actually using it. So on this line of code, it's going to call the constructor and get the start getting the class prepared. Now we can implement a custom constructor that will initialize our variables and stuff like that, which we will do here in a second. So now we have our employee, now we can go e1 dot and call our welcome message. But like I said before, because um, we didn't supply a value for our ID number, it's going to use the default implementation, default value of zero. So when we run the program, we can see welcome from employee number zero, how can I help you? So everything worked, our class is all working, but we just didn't supply an ID number. Now the reason why we didn't supply an ID number is because if we try to go E1 dot, ID number is marked private so that we can't access it. We can't even see E1, I mean we can't even see ID number here so we can't access it or change it because it's private. Now the reason why I don't, I don't just make it public is because I want to enforce um, data hiding and we'll talk about that like I said when we get into properties. So what we, what we can do, however, instead is to implement our dr implement, implement a constructor that will take in an integer, and then we can decide what, assign whatever they pass into the constructor to the value of this variable. So to create a constructor, it's the public keyword because public constructors have to be public. There's no return type, and then it's just the name of the class, so employee. Inside the parameters, I'm going to say I need an integer ID to be passed in. The value passed in, I'm going to assign to the ID number. So ID number equals ID. So this is our constructor right here. Now that we have this, we can see our constructor is erroring because we didn't supply an ID number. So to do that, we need to pass in a number, and I'll pass in a 5. Now the 5 gets passed into the constructor, as you can see if I delete this, and do this again you can see that the constructor is looking for an ID number like we supplied right here in our constructor so we programmed that whatever they pass into there we're gonna assign to the we're gonna assign to the private data here the reason why we can assign to the private data here is because we're accessing the private data through a member of the class because this is a part of the constructor is part of the class we can access it and because we because this constructor is marked public we can access it from outside of the class so that's how we're getting to the private data so now we did this and run the program now now we can see that welcome from employee number five how can I help you is there so the five got passed in and is stored into the ID number section so this is the basics of creating a basic class a basic constructor and a basic function inside of a class and and we, we created an instance of this class and used it. I just want to show you, though, because our employee class is a blueprint, we can use it to create more employees. So employee E2 equals new employee, I'll say 10, and then E2.welcome message. So as you can see, now we run the program now, I'll see the output welcome from employee number 5, how can I help you, and welcome from employee number 10, how can I help you. So we create two different instances of employee, both using the same blueprint. I also want to emphasize on the fact that when we create a employee class or a class in general, we're creating a new customly defined data type. So employees and new data type. Anywhere where you saw previous data types can now be replaced with this new data type. So for example, if we want to build a function that um, took in an employee, so we'll just say this, uh, I don't know, take public static void, take in, and I'll just take in an employee E. Now, I'm not going to put any code for it, but I just want to show you that if I were to call take in, it's looking for an employee so I could pass in my employee E1 or E2 into my function. So anywhere that you use data types before, they could be replaced with your new data types that you created. You can, like I said, you could use it in function calls. You can create arrays of this new data type and uh, lots of other things. So now I want to talk about why, how come I made my 
ID number private. Now, the whole concept of marking things private is to help protect data that your class uses that you don't want to be uh, interrupted or manipulated with only unless it's the class itself because other programmers could be using your classes that you created and you don't want other programmers to access internal data that your class is using and your class is manipulating to to produce its own output you don't want that manipulated by an outside force because they could manipulate it wrong and it mess up the whole class so that's where data hiding comes into play now I'm going to show a quick example of using data hiding and why we use it and how we use it better with properties okay so I'm gonna make a simple program about employees the employees are all going to have a secret password that is associated with each class or each object or each instance of the class. Um, the secret password is going to be used to access the back room of some store. Um, the secret password, however, can only be seen by employees whose ID numbers are greater than or equal to 10. So if you're an employee that has a number that's less than 10, you don't have access to this back room and you shouldn't be allowed access to this uh, the secret password so to start off I'm gonna create a variable that, that okay sorry about that I had to go do something real fast okay so I forgot where I left off but the first thing we have to do is create a variable that's gonna hold our secret password so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make it private I'm gonna say private string password equals and then I'm gonna say password one two three that's our secret password right there now we want to make it so that only employees that have the right idea the right requirements are allowed to see this password um, right now it's marked private so only everything inside the class can see it right now and nothing outside of it can so if I try to access this by outside the class e1 dot it's private, so I can't actually see the data. So we're going to use, we want to show that data, though, however, to the main method right here. But we want to make sure it's controlled. Like I said, if I just made this public now, every single class, everything would have direct access to it. They'd be able to see the password, they'd be able to change the password, and they'd be able to access the password no matter what. We wouldn't be able to monitor any way of saying, if they are ID number greater or equal to 10, then they can see it. We have no way of doing that right now unless we built a custom function, which is what other programming languages do. But we're going to use a different technique. Um, so let's mark this private again. So we're going to build a property to help us manage who can see this password and who cannot see this password and who can change it, actually. So... To create a property, it starts off with the public, because properties are always public. This is what's helping us monitor who can see it, so everyone needs to be able to see this property. So, public, and then the str and it's going to be a string still. We need to change it, but we're going to make an uppercase password. So, the private one's lowercase, and the, the property is uppercase password. The uppercase one is what, the uppercase one is going to be the one that classes use to interact with. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and create the property. We do this by adding our curly braces, like a function, sort of. But inside our curly braces, we're going to specify accessors. We're going to specify two. Get, and I'll explain this in a second, and set. So the get accessors job is to monitor and control when people are trying to retrieve the password. So that's what the get does. When someone's trying to get the password, it does this code and monitors. And if someone's trying to change the password or set the password, this, this block of accessor is used to control and monitor it. So in the get accessors, we need to make sure that the people that are only getting the password, if their ID is greater than 10. So the password is private right here, and they're accessing it through the public one. So we'll say if... The ID number of whoever employee this is, is greater than or equal to 10, then we will return the password to the user. Else, 
if they're not greater than 10, then we'll return, uh, you can't see the password. Very simple. So our get access portion is done. We, we controlled who can access the password and who cannot access the password. So this is, if they have ID greater than 10 or not, then you can't see the password. Now, for the set portion, I'm going to do the same thing. If their ID is greater than the value, then they are allowed to set it. So to do this, I'm going to use an if statement again. I'm going to say if ID number is greater or equal to 10, then I'm going to set the value of password. So it's going to be password equals, and there's a keyword, keyword called value. And the value just means whatever they pass into this property. So then we'll take the, whatever they did and assign it. Um, if their ID is not greater, we could put a message or something. But in this case, I'm just going to make it that if their ID is not the proper ID, it won't do anything. So it won't set it. I could, like I said, put a message to inform the user that their, their ID, or I mean their password has not been set. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. So now that we have this though, we have a fully fully made class that has its private password, and then this is the this is the property that the the users will be able to see. They'll be able to access this property, which fully implements control of who can see the password and who can set the password. If we, like I said, if we didn't use this property, everyone will just have full control over the password to change it or edit it. So properties are used to control. You know who can access uh, private data and what happens when they do change it. I could do other things. I could also maybe, you know, actually I'll do that after. I, I'll add maybe some function calls to this also. But okay, this is our basic property. Now that we have that made inside of our employee. We can make two employees. We have employee one, and I'll make employee two equals new employee, and this guy will have an ID of 11. So we have one with five and one with 11. If I try to go console.writeLine e1.password, which is a property, I can just apply it like this. Depending on my ID number, I'll be able to either access it or not access it. As you can see, since I have an ID number of 5 in this case, I can't see the password. But if I did e2 instead, which e2 has an ID number of 11, which is greater than 10, uh, he should be allowed to see it. So if I run the program, I now have discovered the password, which is password123. Now, like I said, we can develop this a little bit more. Let's say we are making this system that if someone tried to access um, the, the password who is not an height of ID number and they get this message, we can alert security officials that maybe someone is trying to break in or, or something. To do that, we can add a function down here, maybe public void, um, it could be private also, it doesn't really matter, uh, alert, so we're just going to alert, and this alert message is going to just go console.writeLine, uh, say we have a break in, I don't know, or we have a person trying to break in, okay. Very simple, we, a little stupid <laughs> alert message. So now once we have this, you can't see the password, we could also maybe add a little function call, say alert, to alert officials that someone was trying to break in who can't see the password. So now if I go back, change this to E1 again, so E1 is trying to access the password, and on the program, you can see we get an alert, saying we have a, a person trying to break in and then this is the message that the user gets you can't see the password if this was more official we would make it that the message for the alert would be only sent to officials on different screens maybe through a, a tcp server or something like that but uh for now this is just showing you the power of properties so like i said properties are, allow us to hide data and what and show data to certain people under certain conditions and perform certain actions depending on certain conditions okay before we move on let's do one more example of using properties we'll, we'll stick with using an employee but we'll make a little bit a little change so instead let's now give every employee a wallet or some money 
So we'll say private double and everyone has money and I'll say everyone starts out with $500. We want to make sure that when users are spending money or subtracting money, we, uh, we want to make sure that the user has the money before he actually subtracts it and spends it. So we could do a few ways we could make implement properties, which we will, but we can either make functions for our employees to spend money and then our functions would use the properties to control the values. Or we could also allow the user to access the private the properties directly and then uh, depending on the money they could uh, do whatever they have to do. So the first way, uh, first time we're going to do it, we're going to do it as just making a property that the user can try to subtract their money and they can uh, see what happens if they try to subtract too much. So this is going to be really basic. Well, the next time around we'll make the, the spending function. But for this, we're just going to make a basic property that if they try to take and assign the value of money to something that is less than zero, we'll just keep it as zero so that they never get into a negative number. So, for instance, we'll say uh, public double money, e, uh, then our, our curly braces. We'll say get can be like this, and then we'll say set. So the get is going to return the money. doesn't really matter. But the set, we're going to say if uh, money is less than or, uh, or equal to zero, Actually, let's make this less than zero. We'll do something. But first, before we do that, we need to actually take away the money. So we'll say money minus equal value. Um, actually, no, we, we'll say money equals value. We'll use minus equal when we build the function. So whatever the value that you put in for money, we'll assign that. If the money is less than zero, we want to make sure they never go into debt. So we'll just reassign it to zero. This is very simple. So now if we ran the program, I mean, and do this, we have an employee. The employee starts out with $500. If I try to go e1.money equals, I don't know, $200, and then console that right line, e1.money, this is OK. So let's run the program. And we'll see that our money is now $200. But as soon as we try to go to a negative number, let's say we want negative $200 and run it now, our property is programmed that if it's less than two, less than zero, it will get reset to zero. So this will just show you that we can use this in you know bank like banking programs stuff like that to control money. There's another use of properties. There's infinite amount. Like I said, the properties which allow us to control private data. So we're gonna use this to build uh, a, a the spending function sort of. Okay. So this is gonna be very basic. We still have our money uh, property. We're just going to create another function that will allow us to spend some money. So public void spend uh, double value. And we'll simply just go money, the capital, we want to go through the property, money minus equals value. And then console that right line. We're just going to write out the current balance, uh, balance of our money every single time. So we'll go money. So we're going to spend some money and then we'll display the current balance. So this is going to use our property to make sure that we never go into negative, uh, negative amounts of money. The money minus equal value simply is the same thing as writing money equals money, uh, money minus value. It's simply just taking money minus the value so uh, whatever the value I'm spending, I'm taking the, the current value money, subtracting them too, and then the leftover is being reassigned to money. So that's what this line of code does. I taught this in previous lessons. So you have those two lines of code. Now in our function, instead of directly accessing it, which we still could, we could change this up. Uh, but we can now just use our spend function. So I can first spend, let's say, $200. Let me take this out. So I'll spend $200 first, and then you can see that it says current balance is $300 is left over. I'll spend another $200, and then I'll spend uh, another $300. So in reality, 
we would be going into debt right now and be a negative number. But if we run the program, we'll see that our property made sure we controlled our private data. So we had, a, after the first purchase, we had 300 bucks left over. After the second purchase, we had $100 left over. The last purchase, we would have been negative money, but our, 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 our property said that, no, if we go negative, just put it to zero and just show that we're empty. In reality, if we were going to make this more robust and make a really good program to manage money and stuff like this, we would put out alerts, you know, saying that the third purchase wasn't accepted because there wasn't enough money in your account. Uh, we could monitor things like that with function in the function of the spend function, and uh, we could just mo we could do and make it better. But this is just a quick example to show you how we can use properties to control our private data. Like I said, if we didn't use this, and if I, if I just change um, these both to a lowercase m to access the private data instead, so the, the, the uppercase m is our property that goes through and manipulates our lowercase m private data, but it manipulates it using, by, by using the checks and balances. So if we just go in and, and access the private data right away instead and run the same exact program, we can see now if I run this, we can see that my last balance is negative 200. So we did go into the negative 200s because we would access the private data. So that's why we use properties, so we can monitor and, and modify and control our private data. So if I put this back to our uppercase M for our property instead, run it again, we can see the control being implemented with that zero. All right, before I go on, I want to quickly just talk about what the differences are between static and non-static functions, variables, and etc. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this, just get back to the core that we had before. So our, our private data, our constructor, and our function call, and then let's go ahead and delete this. So in previous lessons, I talked about when we used our functions, and created functions in the previous lessons, we used and we made all our functions static. I didn't explain it then, but now this is the time I'm gonna finally explain what static and what not static means. So, when something is marked as not static and does not have a static keyword, they are considered instance. <clears throat> so, uh, this private variable private int id number is considered an instance variable because every instance of employee has its own id number. I want to make this public just to show you how this works. So if I create two employees, E1 and employee E2, <clears throat> both E1 and E2 have their own ID number. I can go e1.id number equals 5 and e2.id number equals 6. They each have their own that's associated with them. This ID number is not associated to e2 at all. So that's why they're considered instance variables because e1 and e2 are separate instances and each of them have their own instance variables. Now I want to modify this and want to use static instead. Static variables, instead of being instance, where each instance has their own, static simply means that it's class-wide and that the entire class owns that variable rather than each instance. So I'll go ahead and make another variable <coughs> called just a test variable called public static int test var. I'll give it the value of 5 for now. So because we made this static instead of instance, if I try to access that variable through an instance variable like E1, you can see that it doesn't come up in our IntelliSense. We don't see the test var here. And like I said, that's because it's for the entire class rather than a specific instance. So if I want to access this static class variable, which is right here now, <clears throat> I access it through the class's name rather than the instant variable. So if I want to access it, I go employee dot. And if now we can see the test var there. 
the test var is associated with the entire class rather than the specific instances of that class. So I can now modify it here. So the changes I make to this variable right here now affect the entire class, no matter what. Same with if I had a static function. <clears throat> if I make a function called a test function, public static uh, void test func <clears throat> function, no parameters, and we'll just say do something here. <clears throat> so we have a test function now that's marked static. <clears throat> Once again, I can't access that static function through an instance of the employee like E1 or E2. Neither of these can see it. <clears throat> but if I create employee or if I call it from employee the entire class, we can see text te uh, test function right here. So that's the basic idea behind static and non-static functions and, and methods. Um, the reason why that I was using and creating static functions when I was going over what functions were <clears throat> is because the main method, which is right here, is marked as static. So <clears throat> in order to make a call to a function from inside a static function, you could only call another static function and if you really think about it, it doesn't make sense because the static function is for the class Y level. If I made an instance function like this, public void test, <clears throat> I wouldn't be able to access this test, fu this, uh, test function by going test. It doesn't work. The IntelliSense doesn't come up. It's because this, like I said, this is for the entire class and this is for a specific instance of the class. So the entire class doesn't know what instance it wants to talk to, so that it can't access an instant variable. But as soon as I make this static, static functions can access static variables. So now I can go, or static functions, so now I can go like this. <clears throat> and now that works. So that's the reason why I was using static in the, the prior lessons. So these are instance variables. These are static variables, and this is a static function. Static is for the entire class, and to access it, you use the class name. An instance is for specific elements or specific instances of the object, and uh, that's, access, that's accessed by the, the variable's name. So e one dot employee dot. That's static, not static. Okay. Now we're going to jump back into talking about a little bit more with um, constructors. So in this class, our constructor is located right here. This is our constructor right here. <clears throat> now, if you remember from previous lessons, when we talked about methods. We talked about the how you can overload a method. And that meant that we could supply uh, different definitions for that method and depending on how many arguments you passed in, it would perform different actions. <clears throat> so if we wanted to overload a constructor, it works the same way. It, I mean, if you overload the constructor, we could either supply an ID number, we could either supply different information, or we could supply no ID number. And depending on what we supplied, it would do different actions. So to overload it, we would just do public, the employee name again. And in this case, let's, let's over, uh, let's, overload it and um, not supply any parameters and if they don't supply any parameters we'll just set the ID number by default to one so now when I create employees I could either one do employee uh, e1 equals new employee pass in a number so I'll say 10 and you, by, if you notice we'll see that our overload constructors are represented here in the IntelliSense our first one is a parameterless constructor, and if we click the arrow, we can see that the next one is that you can also supply an ID number. So I'll supply an ID number of 10 in our first employee. Welcome message. Hold on, let's make this private again. Okay, and then I'll make another employee, E2, and this time I won't put in anything, and E2.welcome message will display the, the default constructor. So this will call the default constructor. The default constructor will come in. This is the default. The default constructor is one that has no parameters. So it will use this one 
and then it says, oh, if, if they didn't pass in anything, I'll simply just set the ID to 1. So if we run the program, we'll see that exactly happened. The first one, we supplied a 10, so it does that. And then welcome from employee number 1. Um, if we don't, don't supply an ID number, it will just default to 1 because of this constructor. Um, we could also we could modify this a little bit more. We could add in a new private data, private string for the name of the employee. <clears throat> we can make another constructor, uh, public employee. <clears throat> they could pass in an int ID or a string name. I'll say string n. And this constructor will say ID number equals ID and string uh, name equals N. Um, so now we have these three constructors. However, if we don't supply, since we have a name now, and they don't supply one in this constructor, we'll have to say name equals Bob by default. So if they don't put in a name, it'll get Bob by default. And, they, and we also have to do that here, name equals Bob. So now you can see we have three different constructors doing three different actions. They, can, they either can create an employee by passing it in, in an ID number and a name for the employee. If they just put in the ID, we'll set the ID and then we'll give them a name. <clears throat> if they don't supply anything, we'll give them an ID and we'll give them a name by ourselves. There are tons of other combinations of constructors that we can make and other things, but these are the three basics. So this is the first two, and now if we uh, make another one, we'll say employee E equals new employee. This one will supply <clears throat> an ID number and a name. We'll say Henry, <clears throat> and then E1 dot welcome uh, E dot welcome message. <clears throat> Before we go on, let's just modify the welcome message to display the employee's name also. Um, we'll just go like this, simply just put in the name here in another placeholder. <clears throat> and then we'll plug in that with name. <clears throat> so now if we run the program, we'll see that the first one, it takes in our ID that we passed and our name. The second one, we just put in the ID, so 10, the name got defaulted to Bob. And the last one, we didn't put anything, so it uses the one and the bob that we defined in our overloaded constructors. So this is constructor overloading. Now, I want to get to one other point real fast that I ran into. You probably didn't notice <clears throat> when I was building this last constructor. I first, it was just instinct to name this. This requirement, I was going to do string name. <clears throat> Now, by doing string name, it gets a little confusing because you don't know, okay, which name am I talking about? If I say name equals name, you can see that we have a little confusion because the compiler doesn't know, oh, do we want this name or this name? So in, to fix this problem, we have, there's a keyword that we can use called the this reference. And the this reference refers to the object itself. So anytime you see this dot, inside of a class definition, you're talking about the class itself or the specific instance that is calling the class or, or using the class. So if I just modify this by going this dot name equals name, this will work now because I'm saying this as the class dot name. So that means this name right here is equal to the parameter name right there. So simply, the this keyword just refers to the reference of the object that's used in the class right there. It's the actual instance of the class. And then by getting the, the reference to that this specific instance that's used in this class, by accessing its name there, it will refer to this name instead. So that's the this keyword. You can use that anywhere. I could say this dot this dot and so on. This just refers to this instance. So that helps you distinguish if you have the same parameter name as the same name of a variable inside your class, you can use this reference to help split it up and everything will still work. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about 
real briefly. This is a, a pretty, for a beginner level introductory uh, lessons, this is a, a pretty advanced topic, <clears throat> and it is a little bit confusing for beginning programmers. So I'm just going to cover the basic and just show one example of it and then move on. In later lessons, maybe I'll go over it again more in more detail, but I just want you to understand and, and notice if someone says, oh, this, let's do this, you know what it means. Okay, so what we're going to do is called operator overloading. Um, now, this is similar to method overloading or constructor overloading <clears throat> in, in the fact that we're um, we're defining new behaviors for different uh, situations and different circumstances. So like in the constructor overloading, if we supply different parameters, we're defining a new behavior that the constructor will do. And this is the same thing with operator overloading. <clears throat> so to begin, let's start out with, let's just refresh your memory on what operators are. <clears throat> if I have an int x equals 5 and int y equals 6, I have a create an answer, and I mean int answer equals x plus y. <clears throat> Our operator in this case is the plus sign. Operators are your plus, your minus, you know, your true, false, plus, plus, minus, minus, not equal to, is equal to, greater than, less than. All those things are operators. <clears throat> so operator overloading says that we can redefine and reprogram the behavior of the operator for our specific class. <clears throat> So, for example, with integers, it by default, the behavior is to add integers together, x plus y. But what if we had <clears throat> and then we wanted to say employee e3 equals e1 plus e2. <clears throat> because we didn't define a behavior for the plus sign with, with employee classes, <clears throat> The compiler has no idea what to do when we want to add two employees together. <clears throat> if you think about it logically, it makes sense. Like, how would the computer know, okay, when we add two employees together, we want to take, you know, the ID numbers, add them together, use the sum of the ID numbers for the new employee, and make a random name, or, like, it has no idea what we can do in, in this situation. So that's where operator overloaded comes in. We'll be able to program the um, behavior of the, using, let's like, say, the plus sign for employees, <clears throat> and then we can we can redefine what the plus uh, operator does when we add employees. Like I said, we also could do the equal sign. Uh, we could do uh, other other types of operators. We could overload and program new functionality for that operator. But all in this example, in this lesson, I'm just going to show the basics of overloading the plus operator. So by by syntax, we're going to create the operator overloading op, uh, in, inside this class. We'll put it right here. <clears throat> we'll make some room for it. So by syntax, we start off with the public keyword. Now, all overloading operators are static so that it's for, it, it's for the entire class. So that's why we mark it static. Then it's the return type. Since we're adding two books together, we're going to most, I mean, not books, we're, gonna, we're adding two employees together. Um, so we're most likely going to want to return a new employee. We could have a return an integer or any type of data. But in this case, we're going to return a new employee. <clears throat> so the operator overloading is going to return an employee. And then we're going to specify what operator we're overloading. So we're going to say operator plus because we're overloading the plus operator. And then our parameters are simply going to be the left side and the right side of the, or the operands of adding this together. So we'll say um, employee E1 and employee E2. So now that we have the header for the operator overload, now we're going to make the body for it. So this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to do when it, we uh, use the plus sign for two classes. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to make a new employee. Actually, we'll do that last. So we need to determine what we want our new class to be. Like we need to, we need to determine what it means to add two employees together. In our case, we're just going to take the ID numbers of the two other classes and combine those, and that will be the new ID number. And we'll use this constructor. <clears throat> 
and the name will be Bob by default and we'll just use this this we'll use this constructor right here <clears throat> so to do this we start off with just creating the new employee so we'll say employee new employee equals new employee but in our in our, our in our constructor we're just going to supply we're going to use this the second constructor which is this which takes in an integer so we're going to pass in e1 the id number plus e2 the id number and then that's our new employee and then we're just simply just return our new employee <clears throat> So this is the whole operator overload. We, we program the new functionality for it. So if we go back into here, let's supply, we'll say this is 10 and 20. So we have two employees, E1 and E2. The E1 ID is 10 and E2 ID is 20. E3 is going to be E1 plus E2, which we know in the background, when we overload the operator, it just adds the two ID numbers from the other class. For the two for the, the two other employees so when we do this line and create our new employee with e1 plus e2 if we go e3 dot welcome message we'll see exactly what happens let's run the code <clears throat> and we see welcome from employee number 30 name is bob how can i help you so it did add the 10 and the 20 together it created a new employee with the 10 and 20 added together it used this constructor, which only takes in an integer ID, and then the name got defaulted to Bob. <clears throat> so, like I said, I don't want to go into this too far because it can get complicated, but I just wanted you to see that the overloading operators allows us to program or reprogram the functionality of pre-existing operators for our new defined classes. So before our operator, if I comment this out, this would error because we don't have uh, a definition of what it means to add two employees together. Once we go ahead and define what it means to add two employees, so what it means to add these two employees together, this is the left hand side. So E1 in this case is E1 here, and E2 in this case is E2 this. So you could think of the comma as the plus sign in this example. This is the left hand side, and this is the right hand side of the plus. And this allows us to reprogram the functionality of the plus sign. And we pretty much defined what it means to add two employees together. So we, we define what it means. It, it creates a new employee and then adds them. And um, it creates a new employee by adding the ID numbers together. But now note that classes are return type, I mean are reference types. So when we return a type employee, we're actually creating the memory from the employee right here. And when we create this memory and hit return, we're returning the reference to this employee. So that's why when we get, well, that's why we don't see the new keyword here. We use we see the new keyword in the overload operator right here, and we return the reference. So E3 just refers to the same memory location that we created in here. <clears throat> so that's why if we make any changes to E3 here, it will also make the changes to them in this memory location right there. So like I said, this is pretty this is high level programming so if you are confused by this don't worry you'll learn it later on in, in, in later lessons and more complex things and, and, and even in other programming languages so um, don't really worry about it if you don't understand this too much right now so the last thing that we're gonna go over in this uh, lesson is creating uh, arrays of our new objects that we created in this case employee so we're gonna make employee arrays um just like how we create an integers arrays <clears throat> we go int array my array equals new <clears throat> int and we specify how big we want it to be like that and then we can go to each element and specify a value the same way we do this is the same way we create arrays of our new defined types except it's a little bit different we still are going to keep this same line of code we're going to create our memory location slots for array in this line of code but when we assign each element of the array we need to give that element its own memory as well so to do this we go um, employee array my em employees 
equals new employee array and we'll say we'll create two employees in this array so that's the same but now however we can't just start going my emps zero dot welcome message right this is accessing the first element of the array which is an employee and then tries to display the welcome message but if we wow if we run this you'll see that we get a no reference exception and it crashes right away saying object reference is not set to an instance of an object which just means that there's no memory location to find for the first element slot <clears throat> so before we start using it we need to define new memory for this first slot well so we'll say my employees sub zero equals new employee and then we'll just we'll pass in a 10 and then a name we'll say uh henry so this we're using the constructor that takes in an integer and a string as a name and a, uh, an id number <clears throat> and then we assign that reference to the first employee slot we'll do that again for the second employee which is the second slot and then we'll assign that and we'll, we'll do a 15 and a uh Sam. <clears throat> so now we have our two employees in our array and we created memory locations for each of them because these are still reference types. So we need to use the new keyword to create the reference to these new memory locations. Now that we have that, we could either just go my employee sub zero dot welcome message or we could throw it into a, a for loop. I'll say for int i equals zero for as long as i is less than my emps dot uh, length. Sorry, uh, i plus plus, <clears throat> and then we'll just go my emps sub i dot welcome message, and then run the program, and we'll see both welcome messages for my array being uh, sent out. <clears throat> Now, just note that you haven't seen this yet, but it works the same way. That's why I'm trying to go past it a little fast. Is because we worked with arrays in that arrays lesson, and we talked about how we can create arrays of integers, and that, I mean, let me show you real fast. If I had, like, once again, int x, or int my array, goes new int array of 2, my array, uh, my array sub zero equals five, and my array sub one equals six. This, why, oops. This we're seeing that uh, this my array sub zero is evaluated to an integer. This equals an integer. This is just the first element of the array, but this is an integer. Same with this. This is a separate integer in the second slot of the array. It works the same way with employees. <clears throat> the first slot of the array is a reference type employee. So this represents an employee object. An employee object. This is the same thing as creating a separate employee object like we did before. So when I have my employee sub i, that represents the employee objects in the array. So that allows us to go dot and access all the uh, the properties of that class because this is an employee. So that allows us to go in my employee sub i dot welcome message. <clears throat> so this is the basics of using an array with our customly defined new data types. Okay, we're going to finish off the lesson with just a quick example of a new class. Um, it's going to be a little simple program that we're going to make. The program is simply going to be called a rectangle. And the rectangle is going to be a class that contains a length and a width and a property for area. When you supply new lengths and widths, the area is going to be calculated and then displayed into a property, and that property can be used to display in the main method. So to get started, let's go ahead and create our class. So go add class. <clears throat> I'm going to make a rectangle. <clears throat> so now you can see our rectangles add to our solution explorer. 
inside our rectangle class, we're going to have a few things. We're first going to have some data fields. One's going to be a private, and we'll, so we'll say double length, private double width, and private double the area of the, tri uh, of the rectangle. We're going to have a constructor that takes in the length and the width of the rectangle. So we'll say public rectangle and double uh, width, double length. Because we have the same names as our class-wide variables, we're going to have to use the this reference to access them. So we'll say this dot width equals width and this dot length equals length. So now our width and length are set through our constructor when we create the rectangle. The next thing we're going to do is we need a function that's going to calculate the average, but we're going to make it private so that users that are using the class can't access the function directly. So we'll say private calc uh, average, I mean not calc area, no, calc area and it's going to have a void return type so private void calculate area and it's simply going to set the area equal to length times the width so this will just set our, our private data to the length times the width we are now going to create properties for our length and width that that when the user changes the length and width it will call the calculate area function and we also need to call it uh, we, we're not going to call it here in the constructor yet because I'm going to change this to access the properties once I define it so the first let's first make our uh, our property for our length. So we'll say public double length get set. We're simply just going to return the length, the lowercase private length, and the set we're going to set the length. So we'll say length equals value. But after we set the length, we're also going to call <clears throat> the calculate average our calculate area function so that every single time the length is changed we're calculating the new uh, area to be displayed in the area proper or the area uh, yeah property which we'll make here in a second <clears throat> same thing is going to be for the width so we'll say public double width To get it's going to return uh, the width and the set is going to set the value of the width and then we'll once again calculate the area and last but not least we're going to do the area uh, public double area and this is just going to be basic uh, get and set to get it's going to turn the lowercase area and the area equals value so we have our three properties length width and area our length and width calculate the area every single time it's changed now I'm going to change these to use the properties so I'm going to use the, the uppercase width and the uppercase length so that's that means that in the constructor it's going to call the properties and use the properties and call the calculate average function once the constructor is called. I could have used the private ones and then explicitly wrote calculate average here, but I'm just going to do it this way. <clears throat> so now that this is all set, I'm going to go ahead in my program and I'm going to make a rectangle. Rectangle r equals new rectangle. I'm going to supply the 5 by 10 rectangle. And then I'm going to just going to say console.writeLine, and I'm going to display the r.area. 
I didn't make any function call to calculate average here or calculate area here. It's all done behind the scenes using these properties. And if I didn't use these properties and I just changed the value of the length and the width, I wouldn't be able to attach this calculate average function to it so that the average would never be, I mean, the I keep on saying average, the area wouldn't be up to date every single time the value of the length and width were changed. So now if I do this and run it, I'll actually see the area being displayed. So hold on, let me just go. <clears throat> so if I run this, we can see the area is 50. If I go ahead and just change um, the R dot, let's say, length to 4 instead, and then re-display the area, we'll see that the value has changed to 20 because of the, the function call. So in, in, after we change the R length of 4, it goes in and changes the, uh, it gets the area, but when I change the length, it's going to the length property, changing the length, and then calculating the average of the length, which then does this again. Now I'm going to change this a little bit up and I'm going to put out the console output is going to be displayed inside the calculate average function. So I'm just going to display the, the area here I mean instead. So now when I change the length and the width it will automatically just display the new values. So if I go r.length equals 4 again I'll see uh, area equals 0, 50, and then 20. Now you may be wondering why does it say 0 and 50 and 20. Well we know where the 20 came from because I changed the R dot length to 4. The 50 is coming from the constructor because when, when we change the width and the length here, it goes in and calculates the average and, and then displays the, the average here. I mean, why do I see one saying average? Area. It displays the area here. But the 0, the 0 is coming from the constructor also because if we look at it, the first time we come in, when we change the width the first time, length is zero. So it goes in, changes the width, it calls calculate average, it then goes into here, <clears throat> and then it does uh, zero times width, which is zero, so that's the area. So now we know where all the values are coming from. But now if I change, I can change the width and length anytime I want, say width is equal to 15, and it will it'll automatically outputs the new area of the of the rectangle. So this is just a, a quick example of using properties and, and creating classes. This is very basic. You can now knowing classes, you can really make some really really cool programs and really create some really cool things. And if I quickly, if I didn't want the uh, the area to do to be displayed on the constructor call. If I just access the private data instead here, the width and the length, lowercase, it wouldn't access the property, and it, so then it would never call calculate average. So until I change the length four and width here, I wouldn't get any output. So now I see the output area twenty and area sixty this way. Um. So yeah, oh, oh, quickly, although you could do it this way, <clears throat> there really, I mean, there isn't a point of doing this. I'm just showing you this all for teaching purposes because by doing it this way, we don't actually see the output of the first, the of the five and the 10 to the rectangle. So to do that, you know, we could just do our custom output here and right here, then said calculate average area. So now if we ran the program, everything would work. The first for the constructor is the 50. Then we changed it once, we changed it again. So like I said, this is not, I'm not trying to build a program that's really, uh, you know, smart and, and used well. I'm just trying to show you all the examples of all the different te techniques that we learned in this uh, lesson. So we learned about classes and then we learned about properties and, and, and things like that and constructors. So... That's the end of this lesson, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.